everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Perspectives. I am so thrilled. I think I said every time, but I'm particularly thrilled about today's guest. We are going to be meeting Dr. Richard Schwartz, who is the, uh, he's on the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He was associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago's Institute for Juvenile Research and later at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. Richard began his career as a systemic family therapist and academic. So his background is definitely in family therapy. He's very familiar with attachment theory. Now, he has developed this methodology, this beautiful body of work. It's grounded in systems theory and he's developed a therapeutic technique called internal family systems therapy or IFS also known as parts therapy. And he developed this and he shares at the beginning of our conversation how it came about. He was working with clients who claimed to recognize they had several components or sub-personalities or parts within themselves, which is separate from having multiple personalities. It isn't that. So he began to focus on these relationships amongst the parts within his clients. And he began to notice that there were systemic patterns in the way they were organized in every client. He observed that his client's parts were often rebellious or troublesome or overly controlling. And when they weren't attended to, uh, they could get a little out of control. So if you've ever had part of you that perhaps flares up a little bit too much or part of you that's over controlling or needs, you've got the perfectionist streak in you or you're a little bit too anxious for the occasion or you find yourself particularly reactive, well, this is really for you because what Schwartz observed is that if we paid attention to our internal narrative and we really tapped into the truth of us, there was an essence of us, a truth to us, a truer self amongst all the anxiety or the controlling or the playing out or the anger or whatever it was. And there was a beautiful self within. And that if we can have our parts feel safe and when they're allowed to relax, and when the clients are allowed to experience their truest self and begin to realize they can trust themselves and love themselves and feel compassion for themselves, that whole beautiful journey to self-compassion, then what can happen spontaneously is the qualities of confidence and openness, compassion, love, clarity, calm, courage begin to show up. And it's in all of us. No one's the exceptions. So from this beginnings of working with clients and these beautiful discoveries internal family systems or ifs came about in the 80s i love it because it's non-pathologizing it's really aligned with coaching it is based on truth it's based on honesty encouragement and acceptance of all of us and true compassion at the deepest level there's no judgment there's no rejection there's no pathologizing any of it and that through this journey of acceptance and compassion and embracing us with a technique and in the podcast dick works with me as a client and you will see the technique play out how we can be in touch with our truer selves that centered self that's in all of us and reach out to a part of us that's perhaps felt not as loved we can reach out to it with love and you'll see in that it's real it's not a role play as i do that and the beautiful consequence of that when that part realizes it it is loved and accepted and hasn't been rejected. It's now evidence-based. IFS is evidence-based. It's become widely used as a form of psychotherapy. Uh, you'll hear in the podcast how uh, it's going to be brought to coaches, which I think is really exciting. He's published a ton of books. One of the books that I've devoured, and you'll hear on the podcast, I've read this a number of times, is Internal Family Systems Therapy by Schwartz and Sweezy. The mosaic mind, I must say, is a little bit more for the therapist, so it wasn't really applicable to me as much. Internal Family Systems Therapy by Schwartz. He's also got a beautiful audible that I do mo parts of it most days called uh, Greater Than Some of the Parts. Uh, he's done other works as well. And I, I, he's also got courses available online at the moment. The beautiful thing about this is his energy. You're going to I'm sure feel as I did with him. He's got a really great energy, a beautiful energy. He's a very open soul, very accessible to chat with about it. And we have quite a long conversation about IFS. We unpack what it is, what the parts are and their different functions within us, what our centered self is and how important it is to recognize this in all of us. 
We talk about how we can bring it into our daily practice. And then what we do is we look at how we can bring it alive in our coaching practices as well, if you're a coach. I believe it's fabulous for leaders, for parents, for anyone who wants to relate at a different level. And I believe its truest gift is its compassionate pathway to ourself. And so here he is, the man himself, Dr. Richard Swartz. It's so great to have you with us today, Dick. I know there is going to be many people around the world interested to hear this conversation. Uh, I know there's also a lot of coaches who are going to be, thousands of coaches will be listening to this, curious about how we can incorporate what you've developed into coaching. Could you start with sharing a little bit about yourself and how you came to be at this point? Well, first, Sharon, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored by uh, how supportive you are of IFS. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's quite a story. It goes back about 40 years. I, uh, mm -hmm. I just graduated from a PhD program in marital and family therapy. And I was one of those obnoxious family therapists that thought <laughs> we'd found the Holy Grail and wanted to prove that. And so in my effort to prove it, I did an outcome study with an uh, eating disorder called bulimia that was sort of new on the scene back then <clears throat> and found that we could reorganize the families just the way the book said to do it and still many of my clients didn't realize they'd been cured and they just kept going. So I yeah. got frustrated and started asking what's going on, why are you still binging and purging and they started to teach this to me. and they would talk to this language of parts and they would say some version of when something bad happens in my life it triggers this critic who's now calling me all kinds of brutal names and the critic brings up this part that feels totally young and empty and alone and worthless and that feeling is so dreadful that almost to the rescue comes the binge to take me away but the act of the binge brings the critic back who's now calling me a pig on top of the other names. Mm. And that, of course, brings back that young, empty, worthless feeling. And so the, the binge has to come back. And to me, as a family therapist, this sounded familiar. It sounded like an inner system that interacted actively inside of my clients. But it also sounded scary at first, because I thought, boy, maybe these, these young women are sicker than I thought. You know, maybe they're more like multiple personality disorder. Until I started listening inside myself, and then I've got them too, and some of mine are as extreme as theirs, particularly the critic, and, and I have my own binges, or did. So with that, I started to just explore, and I was lucky in that I hadn't studied intrapsychic process in other th theories, so that I had to just be curious and just keep letting my clients teach me. And one of the things that was a hard thing for me to learn at first was that these parts aren't what they seemed and that actually there aren't any bad ones. So that took a while because at first I was thinking they were, the critic was an internalized parental voice and the binge was an out of control impulse. And when you think of it that way, it's limited how you can have your client relate to that. Either you try to get them to stand up to the binge or control, stand up to the critic or control the binge. And as I was doing that, I, I encouraged clients to do that. They would get worse, but I didn't know what else to do. So I'd say stand up stronger, control more. Until the first client yeah. that I was aware of that had a sex abuse history and cut herself on her wrists and insisted on showing me the open wounds every session. And I decided we weren't going to let her out of my office until that cutting part had agreed not to do it to her that week. And so after a couple hours of badgering the part, it finally said it wouldn't. And I opened the door to the next session and now she's got a big gash on the side of her face. Yep. And I gasped at that. and just spontaneously spit out, I give up, I can't beat you with this. And the part said, you know, I don't really want to beat you. And that was a turning point in the history of this work because I changed. 
out of that controlling place to just curious, then why do you do this to her? And the part talked about how when she was being sexually abused, it needed to get her out of her body and it needed to contain the rage that would get her more abused. And so I shifted with that. Now I'm not just curious, but I have an abiding respect and an appreciation for the heroic role this part had played in her life. And as I got to know it more though, it sounded like it was still living back in that time. Like it, it didn't realize she had grown up and wasn't in that kind of danger anymore. So with all of that, I started to really change my view of these parts. And now 40 years later, um, I can safely say that uh, there aren't any bad ones, like I said, that it's the nature of the mind to have them. We all have them. They, what we call thinking is them communicating most of the time. And it's, we're born with them. They, they're valuable assets to us as we develop in life. And trauma and what we call attachment injuries, which would be bad parenting basically, force them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be destructive mm. and uh, also freeze them in time and give them what I call burdens, which uh, the definition of which are extreme beliefs and emotions that came into your system from some kind of a trauma and attach to these parts like the COVID virus almost and drive the way they operate afterwards. So to heal them, I, we learned that you have to get them out of where they're stuck in the past and witness what happened to them and then help them unburden, release these extreme beliefs and emotions. And then almost magically, they'll transform immediately when that happens. So, anyway, so that's before a long we get answer. to that, Dick, yeah, that's a great yeah. answer. I just want, I was curious because I have read the story of how you began. I'm curious, I think you may have addressed in one of your books, what was it like for you back then 40 years ago discovering internal family systems when your specialty had been external as we see family therapy what were your colleagues saying what was the what was the lay of the land for you as you began talking about multiple voices in people's heads i'm trying to imagine it's the 70s is that right yeah, yeah well it was and the early 80s early 80s my apologies what was the narrative going on around you with your colleagues as you seem to have made this discovery of an internal world? You know, I was, um, attacked isn't probably the best word, but I, I got a lot of a, a criticism from both sides. My mm. family therapy colleagues felt like I was betraying the cause because huh. family therapy, a pendulum swing away from psychoanalysis or psycho, traditional psychotherapy where you spent a lot of time focused on the individual and their intrapsychic process. And family therapy said, no, we don't need to do that. We can change everything by just changing these external relationships. So a lot of my, and I, you know, I was building a reputation in that field. I had co-authored the basic textbook that was the most popular yeah. textbook by then. So a lot of my colleagues, uh, saw me as a traitor and uh, were pretty vocal about it. Mm. And then I developed it in a department of psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And it was a very psychoanalytic department. And the uh, one of the, the big luminaries in that department uh, took me to task, claiming that I, mm. I was fragmenting people by having them focus on these things and th yeah. that I was dangerous basically and tried wow. to get me fired. So, so that, yeah, it was a rough ride back then. And, mm. you know, in retrospect to get through all of that, I had to rely on parts of me that could be arrogant and didn't care what mm. people thought and just yeah. said, I don't, you know, and, and we're very protective of other, very vulnerable parts would be that felt really worthless and were, you know, mortified that people would be judging me that way. Yeah. 
And so there wouldn't have been papers produced, there wouldn't have been a team of colleagues that you could talk with about this. Your entire narrative was with your clients. And then there's literally, your, there's known unknowns and then there's all the unknown unknowns and you were dealing with nearly all unknown unknowns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was pretty lonely for quite a while and then mm. I started getting the courage to talk about it more. Uh, mm. I started to draw students who were very interested and so we we had a little kind of study group where we would compare notes every session and and some of them actually contributed quite a lot in the early stages of this. Uh, a woman named Mitchie Rose in particular. Yeah. And, uh, and so that really helped when I felt like I had a kind yeah. of support system, yeah. Good, I'm pleased. I can't, I'm imagining back then, if the feedback you're getting is from clients saying one thing and your colleagues are saying another, the internal conflict for you must have been the greatest because external acceptance from your colleagues when you're in the role you're in is what you'd always measured your progress by until then. And now there, none of that existed. None of what you'd counted on, you could rely on anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I come from a very scientific family. My father was a yes, high-powered medical researcher, physician, and he always talked about follow the data, even if it takes you way outside your paradigm. And if if you're consistently getting this data, even if it's some ter totally controversial, um, just stay with it. And yeah. that was a huge lesson for me. And he he was quite supportive, even though it all sounded kind of bizarre to him too. Yeah, well, good. So can you talk us through what IFS is, internal family systems? Can you give us a snapshot in your own words so those who are unfamiliar can un have a deeper sense of what it is? <clears throat> yeah, so it's been a form of psychotherapy but it's also becoming more and more a kind of life practice. And, uh, mm. and we are trying to bring it to other groups like yours. And it uh, involves some basic assumptions about people that are different than the most common assumptions about human nature. One of which is that it's, it's the natural state of the mind to be multiple and to have what we call parts and that each of these parts are individual personalities that uh, have a full range of emotion and belief and thought and and interact inside in a system and that that system is uh, can be studied and and uh, transformed and that these parts aren't what they seem that they're all valuable and forced into extreme roles and also that just beneath the surface of these parts that I've talked about is what I'm going to call the self, which is a kind of essence that uh, is in everybody, can't be damaged, and knows how to heal. Knows how to heal these parts once you access that self. And knows how to heal external relationships also. And, and so a lot of the IFS has become helping people access that essence and in that state begin to relate to these parts and to relate to their intimate partners or relate to their the people they, that work for them or that they work with. Or, so to, to um, encourage what we call self-leadership both internally and externally and the, I stumbled on ways to access that very quickly in most cases. Mm. The way I look at IFS is it's the easiest way I've found to help me with my inner reactivity. Mm -hmm. That's that's what IFS has given me. It's the fastest way and the easiest way I've found to help me process my reactivity, my, if you want to call it triggers, I don't like that word, but my inner reactivity, so I don't play it out on the person I'm with, or I don't play it out on what I think is the source of my upset. Instead, right. uh, the gift for me is if I think the source of the upset is someone else, to me, IFS tells me that is a gift for you now to have the opportunity to look within. 
That's and right. IFS shows us how to look within because there are plenty of uh, modalities, Dick, that say go within, but they don't tell you how. <laughs> it's like meditate or sit with it or see what comes. That's not helpful. And as someone it's who's been perfect. doing this for a while, it just doesn't help me. So IFS yeah. has shown me the steps of, okay, that, I, that can't be the source, but that is a lesson. That gives me the yeah. opportunity to go within and we'll walk through the process of that, hopefully. And then I can then deal with my reactivity instead of thinking they have to change. It's a gift and an opportunity for me to grow in that area. Beautifully said, Sharon. And um, in that way, you're using the other person as what we call a tormentor. Yes. By tormenting you, they're mentoring you. Tormentor with a hyphen between the tor and the mentor. Yep. They're mentoring you about what you need to heal. And and also in our crazy language, you're following the trailheads that that person has put in your face, mm. Mm. which are the emotions and thoughts and, and uh, impulses that if you focus on, will take you to a part that needs your attention, that needs your help, so. Yeah, so we'll just slow it down there. So the way to, my understanding is the way to know that a trailhead, a trailhead is a thought, emotion, a physical movement that you intended or didn't intend. It could be a sensation. It could be a visualization. It could be a just a, a thought feeling. Any of that are opportunities or what IFS would call a trailhead to a part. And there's nothing bad about it. That's the thing. It's not that we're, there's no bad parts. In all the years you've been doing this, there's not a, you've never come across a part that wasn't lovable ultimately and we couldn't That's feel love right. for. That's right. And I've worked with people who, you know, whose parts had made them do heinous things. I've yeah. spent seven years working at an agency for sex offenders and uh, I, we, we do this work in prisons now with people that have murdered people. And even those parts, when you have the person find it and focus on it and instead of fearing it or hating it get curious uh, those parts will tell their secret histories of how they were forced into the roles they're in and how they carry the burden of their perpetrator's energy that drives them to want to perpetrate and so on and so on and what was your i, I don't know if this is putting you on the spot but what was the recidivism rate after working with IFS on people who'd done those crimes? Well, we didn't do real good outcome uh, studies with it. Uh, you know, anecdotally, the people that I know of uh, did really well, but mm. we don't have a, a clear outcome study. So I'm loath to, to say more than that. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, so someone listening, because I'm familiar with it, I don't want to make too many assumptions about what people know. <clears throat> so we'll just slow down there. So a part is uh, a trailhead is a thought, a feeling, a, a sensation. It's a visualization. It's a voluntary movement or involuntary movement, which is an indicator we could meet a part. And in IFS, we want to meet that part. So can you walk us through the types of parts there are? Because I, I, I know there are types of parts and once people get familiar with the world that we're about to build for them, it's really fun to play in that world. It's joyful to know how to go inside and translate what we're saying into activities. So can you walk us through, let's just start with the basics, the types of parts. Yeah, well, again, I'm a systems thinker, family therapist. So as my clients were, were describing this landscape to me, I started to look for distinctions. And the big distinction that leaped out immediately was between, there were some parts who uh, were quite young and sensitive, and because they were sensitive inner children, the traumas affected them the most. And so they would wind up carrying, you know, it would be like uh, an inner little girl inside of you before she got hurt, you loved her and it was, she gives you all this delight in the world and the desire to get close to people and playfulness and creativity. But after she gets hurt, 
now she carries the burden of emotional pain or terror or shame or something like mm -hmm. that. And now you don't want anything to do with her uh, because she can make you feel as bad as you felt during the trauma. And she's still stuck back there. And so you consciously or not lock her up inside in a way we call exiling and try to just move on, just move on. I know like the US, Australia is a kind of just move on culture, mm. like rugged individualists. And yeah. so you think you're just moving on from the memories and the emotions from the trauma, not knowing you're locking up your most precious qualities in, the, in, mm. in doing that. So these we call exiles. And when you get a lot of exiles, you feel much more delicate and the world becomes much more dangerous because all kinds of things could trigger those parts. And when they get triggered, it's like flames of emotion are gonna totally consume you and overwhelm you and make it so you can't function sometimes. And so then a lot of other parts are recruited into becoming these protectors to try and contain those exiles and protect them from the world. And some of them do that by trying to manage your life so that uh, the exiles don't get triggered. They, they manage your relationships so that you don't let anybody get too close or you don't let people you depend on get too distant or they manage your appearance so that you don't get rejected. They manage your performance so you get a lot of accolades to counter the worthlessness that the exiles feel. So we call them managers. It's one class of protector. And then despite the best efforts of these managers, you still get, the world still has a way of breaking through those defenses and an exile comes bursting out. And that's a big emergency. So there's another set of parts, protectors, whose job it is to deal with that emergency right now. Like I've got to get away from this feeling or it's going to kill me. And so mm -hmm. they are the ones that do the binging uh, the impulsive, reactive, like the reactive, reactive part of you you were talking about. Uh, and they don't care about the collateral damage to your relationships or your body. They've just got to get you away and do it immediately. And so that's the other class of protector. So it's a pretty simple map. Yes. And again, I want to reiterate that these aren't descriptions of the actual parts. It's descriptions of the roles they're forced into. And once released from these roles, they often do something entirely different, sometimes quite the opposite of the role they're in. Mm. It's always valuable. But so that is the, the little map. Managers, firefighters, both of whom are protectors, pr trying to protect and contain these exiles. So can we go through an example with someone who might be experiencing anxiety? Can we create a construct of a person so our viewers can get a sense of what an example of that could be? I'm, and I'm happy to share my example if you can share an example of those three in action. We could. We could also role play it if you wanted or could actually work with your anxiety if you have any. It's, uh, I actually had, did think about something I would... Yeah, well, let's make it real. And I did think about something that, and I very carefully didn't do any work on it. I did not do any IFS. And yes, I'm more than happy to demonstrate it because I have an inkling, I have a trailhead, which is a thought feeling uh -huh. that I'm happy to. Let's do it. So what's the thought feeling? Uh, feeling here in my gut sometimes high in my gut and sometimes low of uh, righteousness or needing to be right needing to correct and make Great. it right and there's a tension around it dick like there's a tension like i want to this has got to be right yeah it's got to happen right away right uh yeah. is it got to happen right away Yes, there's an urgency to it as well. Yes, there is an urgency. 
So as you notice all that in your gut, Sharon, mm. how do you feel toward that part of you? I don't feel anything towards it just yet. Hang on. It just is. Well, in other words, do you, it just is. You don't have an attitude about it. You don't want to get rid of it or you, you just, just notice. No, it. I want to understand it. I want to understand it. It just is. And I would love to understand okay. it. Yeah. I certainly don't feel anything negative okay. towards it at all. It's part of me. Great. So focus on it again down there and let it know you're curious about it and just ask what it wants you to know about itself and wait for the answer. Don't think of the answer. Just wait for an answer to come from that place. I'm here. I want to be heard. Okay. Are you open to hearing it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So let it know you're ready and just see what it wants you to hear. It's hard. I work hard. There's a lot to think about. This part works hard. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just hearing what it's saying. I work hard. There's a lot to think about. Uh -huh. It's a tough job. Someone's got to do it. Right. And Sharon, ask it what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this tough job. get judged. Yeah. So you'd make a mistake and get judged or how would you get judged? Is it okay that I just take a moment? Cause I'm really, it takes a while for this oh. to happen for me. Yeah. I'm just going to go inside and be, Sure. Whatever you need. There's a sense of it would get criticized if it didn't get it right. It wasn't a sentence. It was okay. a feeling. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So let it know that that makes sense to you. You can understand that. And how are you feeling toward it now? I feel really compassionate. I'm giving it a big hug. So let it know that. Yeah. Perfect. How's it, how's it reacting? Melting. Melting Good. into me. That's great. It's like, uh -huh. all the weight just a went. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Maybe ask it how old it thinks you are. 10. Yeah. So maybe when you were 10, it needed to worry like this. But let it know how old you really are. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm going to fudge it a little bit, but I get what you're saying. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and see how it reacts. Okay. See how it reacts to the news that you're not 10 anymore. It's in awe. I just went, wow. And it's looking up <laughs> like, wow, it's amazing. You're so old. <laughs> 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 yeah, but let it know. What? 
<laughs> it's finding it funny that I'm that old. Uh huh. <laughs> but let it know that since you're not 10, you can do a lot more anticipating and and controlling yeah. the world than you could back then. So it can rely on you a little more than it thought it could. And just see how it reacts to that idea. It's just hugging me. It's great. It's like the easiest yeah. hug. Like I've done some parts work before, but this one's just like, of course, you're here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, ask it what it would need from you going forward to really trust it didn't have to work so hard. To know that I love it. Huh? That that's the strongest message I've got from Wow. To know I love you. Yeah. Yeah. So Sharon, are you are you good with that? Can you Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure Done. Part? Yes, yes, I okay. am. So tell the part you're gonna do that for it. Yep. I'm doing it right now. Fantastic. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> How's it reacting? Just love is love and playfulness and excitement i can't even explain it but there's excitement and there's freedom and there's playfulness like a and almost a show off playfulness <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I'm just telling it so it's amazing could, and loved. Uh-huh. That's great. So does that feel complete for now? It feels awesome, Dick. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know how to recognize complete, but it feels amazing and so close. Yeah. There's we'll no distance the now between us. There's this, yeah. we're a team. That's great. And then tell the yeah. part. Just that you're going to follow up on it every day. You're mm -hmm. going to remind it that you love it. Yeah. At least for a month. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then when you're ready, you can come on back outside. That's just fantastic. Yeah, it was a great example. <laughs> uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> I feel amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Goodness. wonderful. And yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a great demonstration of the work. I'm still there a little bit, just enjoying. Uh huh. I don't want to drag you away. Yeah. I just feel really tingly. Oh my God, my fingers feel electric. That's what we call self energy. <laughs> when, when, you, when you help a part like that, it opens the channels for this energy to flow through your body. I read about it and I was feeling kind of ripped off because it never happened for me when I've done my parts work. <laughs> so, uh <-huh. laughs> oh my God, I feel all tingly and it's all electric. It's like, um, you know that when you touch static? Yeah. 
feels all static all down my hands. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that'll be more accessible to you now because that, that little worry part was blocking it. Okay, I just need to have people know who are watching this, this is... It's real, right? <laughs> this is very extraordinary feeling. It's still it's there very, as strong as... It's a very healing energy. And uh, that's part of how you know when yourself is in your body, because you'll start to feel more of that. So everything feels like it's static and electric. Uh -huh. I know you know this, but this is, <laughs> I'm having quite the trip right now. <laughs> Very cool. Wow, that is extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. I was very happy, happy to do it with you. Oh, wow. Okay, coming back. And that just stays? I just get to have this? Well, yeah, you, you got to keep uh, taking care of that little, little part. And there might be other parts that will block it at different points for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's just there. It's just in you and around you. It's, and it's so good. If you're, not, if you're not feeling it, then you just track down the part that's blocking. Okay. It's like the best investigation you can ever do for yourself on yourself. That's how I look at it. That's right. Wow, it's very powerful, Dick. That is that feels extraordinary. Yeah, as I you know, as I go through my day, uh, I'm noticing how much of that I'm feeling. And if, okay. if I'm not feeling much, I'll just find like there are my you know usual suspects in my forehead and on my shoulders and. I'll notice them and I'll just remind them they can relax and then I just feel it moving into my body. Yes, yes. I've started doing that with a couple of parts. I visit them every day and have been for a month and we're getting on really well. But this mm -hmm. level of charge, this is new. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Next question. <laughs> I feel a little high. Is that something that's been said to you before? Yeah, yeah. Especially I, when you when you've helped uh, a key <laughs> part, because the part is feeling so great. You're just feeling the delight of this little this little one. Okay, let's call it delight and not high. But I'm feeling a little high. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things, I'm going to have a go now at where I wanted to head in this conversation. Thank you so much for that. That's, wow, wonderful. I'm going to have that all day with me. That's just tremendous and I will visit every day. So I hope that's a great example for people who are watching or listening on how powerful and wonderful this is. To me, it's joyful work, Dick, when I go in and follow the trailhead and find the part. And what I love and I hope that's demonstrated is it would be so easy on the surface to judge that part. Oh my God, you need to knock it off. And why am I always so blank? And I wish I no. wasn't. And oh God, I've done it again. And instead, if we now know how to embrace it and get to know no. it and find out its positive intention, we realize all along it was on our team, but it was That's doing right. it at the age at which it learned how to protect us. That's exactly right. Very well said, Sharon. And I was kind of surprised when I asked you how you feel toward it, that you didn't say something like that. I, I'm annoyed by it or I wish it would yeah. go away. Because most people do. That's the first thing most people say. Yeah, they do. I've been doing a bit of work in IFS for a while. I'll, I'll give you the yeah. heads up. <laughs> okay. And I think even before I knew IFS, I realized I've got to love all of me. And one of the things they teach in coaching is we uh, – to reject any emotional aspect of ourselves is to reject ourselves. And the path yeah, to self-love is to accept all of us, even the bits that we don't understand or relate with. That's 
partly why I'm so excited to bring this to coaching and why I'm so excited yeah. to talk to you. Because I think yeah. in some ways more than psychotherapy, IFS is a, a really good match for the yes. philosophy of coaching. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to that because I'll share with you uh, soon how I'm bringing IFS or aspects of it for non-clinical populations to coaching because there are aspects of it I've already pulled and we're starting to put into the curriculum and I'd love to chat with you about it. So we've got exiles who see the world as dangerous possibly and yeah. they're pro probably more delicate. Then we have the yeah. managers or protectors who have no tolerance for fear or shamefulness or emotional pain. And they'll do anything to hide the exile. It's almost like they're a guardian is the way I picture them. That's right. Yeah. There's a lot of common manager roles. So there is. There, there are managers that keep you in your head all the time and, and don't let you feel your body and keep you intellectual. And then there are managers, uh, particularly for women, who take care of everybody so and, and never let you take care of yourself. And there are managers who uh, scan for danger all the time and are, are a little hypervigilant and so on and so on. And you know, there's a lot of, comp and again, they're just the roles these, like yours, was just forced into. Mm. But um, what they share in and then common. We have a f and then we have a firefighter above that whose role is yeah. if the exile breaks out, they're going to come in and they're going to suppress it and they don't care who they hurt, how they lash out. Collateral damage means nothing to them. That's right. Yeah, which means there's a built-in polarization between managers and firefighters because managers are all about keeping you in control and pleasing everybody and firefighters do the opposite most of the time. Not yes. always, but and so that's what I was saying earlier with the bulimic who the binge part was her firefighter and then the manager was attacking her for letting the binge take over like that uh, because it would, you know, make her heavy and so on. Yeah. And so most of us have that kind of battle going on inside between managers and firefighters uh, and that battle becomes self-perpetuating because the more shame these inner critics, which is another common manager role, give you, the more they shame you, the more that goes right to the heart of these little exiles who feel even worse now. So that makes the job of the firefighter even more important. Mm -hmm. And then the, so you're in that vicious cycle. Yeah. So I'm picturing somebody who uh, has, say they can't control their temper, for example. If I was to put that in IFS narrative, I possibly would sense, see what this gives me, Dick, this is another great gift of it. You'll never see anybody else the same way again. Because if you see someone angry, you know you're probably seeing a firefighter, which means their exile is feeling unsafe and the protector didn't do the job. So there's a lot more compassion now with interactions. Instead of just judging it or blaming it or rejecting it, you can yeah. observe it from a compassionate detachment. Bingo. Yeah, that's beautiful. That You're really getting it. I'm very impressed how deeply you've got the model because that's right. It's almost like you have x-ray vision in the sense that you see past the your opponent's protectors to the the vulnerability and the pain and the yeah. terror and the shame that drive those protectors and yes. you can have compassion which doesn't mean you don't you don't stand up to that person but you can stand up to that person from self we haven't talked about this yet but we're getting to self, self definitely okay so the, as i was seeing this in everybody this was like the same person would pop out when parts would open space i started to catalog the qualities that would would come out in that person and that would be things like calm and curiosity and confidence compassion and as you're getting they all begin with the letter c uh courage, courage. clarity uh creativity connectedness and connectedness and uh, three of those, confidence, clarity, and courage, means that self can be very forceful 
and clear and and can take a stand, but mm. with compassion, with with also with compassion. And that's mm. you know when I work with leaders, I'm working with lots of social activists now, and um, many of them have these very angry, judgmental parts that they do their activism from that motivates them. And we're getting those parts to relax, similarly to how we had your anxiety part to relax and trust their self to do their activism. And when they do that, they're just much more effective activists. So could we go so far as to say some activists are activists because they don't know how to manage their internal journey? Yeah, yeah, a lot of activists got hurt somehow yeah. uh, or had a you know trauma and had a part say, I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. Yes. And that's driven them, which is great. You know, it's, it's, it's great that it's got them where they can do this, but it also polarizes. Well, if the problem I see with it is activism, when it's taken to the extreme in the terms of IFS, is it's a firefighter who will shame someone else because they don't care about collateral, collateral damage. So they will shame. They will tear down. They will try to destroy someone metaphorically because they're coming from a place where they haven't got in touch with the part that needs the healing. That's right. So they're going to keep using the world as a landscape to resolve, which only can be resolved through this internal journey. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so I'm helping them uh, regain the trust of those protectors helping the self get trusted again by the protector to lead just in the way yours did. Yeah. And then yeah. we're also, which we, we didn't do, but we're also going to what the protector protects and, mm. and healing. And that isn't necessarily the domain of coaches. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, and I'll that, talk to you about that in a moment. We'll talk about um, true self now. And then I'd love to chat with you about how coaching and coaches can integrate IFS because I do see some very strong parallels that are beautiful. So the our cell, I call it our true self in our trainings. You call it the self with a capital S. Can you walk us through, can you introduce us to this phenomenal, remarkable truth <laughs> that we all have a self? It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just stumbled into it because uh, my family therapy background, I was trying to get clients to have a different kind of conversation with these parts as I was learning about the parts from my clients. Once I got hip to the fact that they're not what they seem and that they deserve to be listened to, I was trying to get my client to get curious and interact and have a dialogue, much the same as you, got, as you did with your part just now. And I was finding that as we were t saying earlier, maybe let's say I'm having one of these bulimic kids try to talk to her critic and it's going okay because she's staying curious, but suddenly she's angry at the critic and then the critic gets defensive and escalates. And it reminded me of family sessions where I'm working with a teenage mm. girl and her critical mother. Yeah. And as I'm having them try to get along better, she suddenly, the girl gets angry at the mother and you look around the room and you see the father is cueing her that he disagrees with the mother too. And she's fighting his battle for him. And mm. so we taught his family therapists to get him out of her line of vision, get him to step back in the room and create a better boundary around the mother and the daughter. And when you do that, the girl settles down and they do have a decent conversation. I thought maybe the same thing's happening in this inner system. Hmm. Is I'm trying to have my client talk to her critic. A part who hates it has come in and is doing the talking. So I started asking clients, can you find the one who just jumped in and is so angry at the critic? And could you get it to step back in there? Basically the same intervention. Or relax or open space. And as they would do that, because I was amazed that people could do that. They would just, yeah. okay, it did suddenly they would turn into this other person who had lots of 
curiosity, calm, compassion for the target part. And things would go really well and I could get out of the way and they would just take over the session because they knew how to relate to that part in a healing way. And when I would do it with other clients, it was like the same person popped out. And so at some point I started asking, what part of you is that? And they'd say some version of, that's not a part, that's me, that's myself. So I came to call that self with a capital S to distinguish it from the common use of the word self, which is means the whole person. And now again, 40 years later, thousands of clients later, thousands of people using this all over the world, we can safely say that that is in everybody and it can't be damaged and it knows how to heal. And, and as we were saying earlier, that's a big deal. It's amazing. And, it, and it's there in everyone. There are no exceptions. So for anyone who's yeah. listening, who's got huge soft doubt or the challenges around self-esteem or they're convinced that somehow they've got a flaw, you also have this centered self that is filled right. with calm and clarity and compassion that is filled with a sense of connection and creativity and curiosity and confidence and courage. It is innate in all of us. It cannot be damaged. It cannot be taken away. It is innate in every single person. There are no exceptions. And now for the person who's listening thinking, yeah, but I am the exception. You're Even you are not the exception. <laughs> it is in you. <laughs> That, that's right, and and it's just beneath the surface of these parts, such that when they open space, it just pops out. And yeah. and as you were experiencing earlier, there is an energy to it, a vibrating yeah. energy that runs through your body, and uh, and it's you know it's what people meditate to get to, but this is a yes. a quicker way to get to it, and then not only get to it, but act actually from it begin to lead your life both internally and externally and this is the real key uh let's walk through in a scenario so i if i know someone who's very very defensive for example and they're hearing this going well, i don't feel very centered i don't feel the eight c's mm -hmm. can you describe just a hypothetically how is their centered self or their true self hidden if it's somebody, yeah, let's it's describe this person as defensive, they're um, overly protective, they're highly self-conscious. Yeah, it's what we call blended. The, the defensive part has blended with their self and thinks it has to, sort of like your little worried part, blends with you sometimes and makes it so you don't feel very secure. The parts have that ability. They can, they can take over uh, and you can totally see the world through their eyes when they do that. Yeah. And so a lot of the work is just convincing them that they don't have to do that. And as, as we found, they're often stuck back in times when they, they did need to do it when you were 10 and, and are not aware that they don't still need to do it. So. So the defense and the part thing is, would, go ahead. So I was going to say, and it's not that they take over the centered self. I don't want anyone hearing thinking the centered self can be hijacked or in any way co-opted to work for a protect. It doesn't. It is sacrosanct. It is sacred within us. It is the seat of our consciousness. It is unblemished right. through all of time. But the protectors right. take over and it takes a back seat. It is in no way blemished though. Yeah. Yeah, in, in a sense, they they can take over, and um, and partly because it can happen so quickly that they blend with us that we're not even aware of it, and we just start to look through at the world through their perspective mm. until you start to get hip to it and you you notice. So, I I work with lots of clients who who have a lot of uh, very extreme protective parts that they're quite blended with. And so gradually I help, I say, no, that isn't you. That's this defensive part. Let's get to know it. And as they get to know it, then they get a little separation from it. 
And then as they separate from it, they get a little more access to sell. And then if something happens that that the defensive part gets, uh, I know you don't like the word triggered, but what's the word you use? Reactive. Reactive. And, yeah. If, if it takes over again, now they kind of notice it's taken over, whereas before mm -hmm. they wouldn't. They would just be that part. Yes. And And instead of going with all of its paranoid stuff or whatever it's saying, while they notice it's taken over, inside they can kind of say, it's okay, I'm here still, mm -hmm. I, can, I can handle this. And so that becomes the way to handle your anger rather than all the, you know, affect regulation skills that you have to learn, all that stuff. Yes. And the way you put it, Dick, is we're going to learn to speak for our parts instead of from them. And I love That's that right. distinction. So rather than just feeling reactive and then acting on that reactivity, it's that cause and effect. I feel it, so I'm going to say it. It's hang on. Right. I feel it. Reassure it. Remind it that you're here and you've got this and then speak for it. And just That's say, right. I'm feeling, part of me is feeling whatever it's feeling, right. part of me is feeling tense right now, part of me is feeling upset with the way that you put that and it's really feeling uncared for. So I'm just gonna take a moment, I'm gonna breathe into it because right now I feel like a part of me wants to lash out, but there's a bigger part of me that wants to maintain that connection with you. And that's a very different scenario in the conversation with someone you love versus just coming from that reactivity with the justification and the heat that we can feel. Yeah, I, I'm continually impressed with how deeply you know the model. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. But well, that's it might right. be a good opportunity to just do this. <laughs> <laughs> Internal Family Systems Therapy um, by Schwartz and Sweezy. Is that the one you recommend? Yeah, well, that's for therapists, but coaches uh, would get a lot out of it too. It, it's yeah. the second edition that people want to get. Okay, well, I, I really have been studying it, Dip, because I've found it a very joyful way to um, get in. I am a meditator, and I'm a very poor meditator. I'm the first to say that. So finding IFS and realizing I now have something to bring to my meditate, my daily practice has been mm -hmm. very energizing for me, and I enjoy doing it now, whereas before it's been quite a challenge. And so there's been a lot of joy around that internal journey now because of the guidance that you've provided. One of the things I love about self is um, in many traditions, in fact, all throughout history in the spiritual traditions, the self is a witness or is a uh, mm -hmm. is silent and still. But for you, Dick, and for IFS, the self is very active and That's shows right. up and doesn't just witness. Can you just flesh that out a little bit? Yeah. Um, again, you said it really well, and that's a lot of what spiritual traditions are designed or, or try to achieve is to have you in that witness consciousness where you're noticing your thoughts and emotions, mm. you're not blended with them, and you're noticing them maybe from a place of acceptance, but you're pretty passive. You're not active with them. You're just kind of yes. witnessing them. And for me, it's not compassionate to watch suffering beings parade by. So if you think of these as merely thoughts and emotions, it makes sense to separate and just witness. But if yeah. you think of them as suffering beings, which is what I feel like they are, yes, then no, you're not going to just sit there and watch them. You're going to go and try and do what you did with your, your little one a minute yeah. ago. And you're going to become an active leader that they can trust. Because most of these parts are quite young, even the ones that seem so smart and and uh, protective are, you know, usually not more than a teenager. And mm. they aren't equipped to run a whole person. And mm. they actually, when they see that you're not 10 and, and that you're a good deal older, <laughs> <laughs> they, get, they get, get a lot of relief from that because it's yeah. like Lord of the Flies, you know, it's like, a bunch of little kids mm. just trying to make it and here yeah. comes some adult and they oh my god okay yeah 
I love it. It's fantastic. One of the things that I'm loving is my daily practice. So if I was to talk about IFS in terms of outcomes, it brings me closer to flow, what Nihai Nuchitsky High talks about, that state of flow. To me, it's about helping me experience balance on the inside and on the outside. It helps me know that my outside world is an opportunity for me to learn more about how I've created my inside world. Is there anything else you would add in terms of that, in terms of IFS, day, just regular daily practice? Yeah, uh, it's also fascinating as you're finding, you know, that who knew there was all this stuff going on inside of you that is so interesting. And so, so that and uh, the more you heal these very, very vulnerable exiles, then the more the whole system uh, relaxes. And so the goals of RFS, there are four. One is the liberation of these parts from the, the extreme roles they were forced into, which is what we did really quickly with your uh, little one. And then, uh, and then helping those parts start to trust self more as the leader both internally and externally, and then reharmonizing the inner system. So not only the parts liberated from their roles, but they begin to get to know each other and work together. Uh, and you'd stop noticing them very much because they're just doing what they're here to do. They're doing what they're designed to do. Mm. And it's almost like, I don't know if you ever saw the murmuration of starlings that uh, those videos, uh, check it out. Oh, I have. Of yeah, yes, yeah. It's like that. It's like they're working as one organism and you yeah. feel much more integrated uh, and, and, and there's a, a kind of beauty to that. And then you can be in the world in a much more integrated way so that you're, the things you used to fear doing, you just don't have the same fear about. Mm. And uh, and that's a lot of what I'm doing with activists and and yeah you know, the things you used to rely on these intense protectors you don't need anymore mm. and so you can like we were saying earlier you can see the the pain that drives people like Donald Trump and and yeah and all those extremes even while you're not letting him ruin the country mm. and and then. You also are no longer so afraid to get really, really, really close to an intimate partner because uh, they can't hurt you in the same way. Mm. And so, yeah, it's, there's a lot to, to be said about it. And also you can get hurt, but handle it. It doesn't create right. this massive flare up. It doesn't become an emergency dick. That's the difference no. for me. I'm still going to exactly get hurt. Right. But I, it's That's just right. not going to turn into an emergency. That's right. It's not going to be an emergency. And when I get hurt, I know to go to the part that was hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And comfort it and hold it in the way you just did, mm. rather than lock it away. Mm. So that's that's we're trying to bring this to education so that kids learn at an early age. If yes. I get bullied, I don't have to exile the part that got hurt. I can mm. embrace it and, and unburden it mm. in the moment. Yeah. yeah, that's important. So let's talk about coaching and IFS. I can see some really beautiful parallels and some synergies there. One of the first things that I've took from uh, IFS immediately into my coaching, so I coach some clients, is the beautiful compassionate sense that whatever's coming up for them, there is going to be compassion for that part, acceptance, not tolerance, it's not even tolerance, it's acceptance and embracing and understand that that part of them was geared at that stage of their development to do the job the best they could. And the moment right. we can relieve them of that job and find out what they'd prefer to do, they then have just co-opted their centered self now has somebody else on their team to help them right. be all they can be. Because right. I believe totally. coaching really is, I don't think coaching is goal setting, I believe I think that's so superficial. I believe coaching's truest purpose, it is truest core, is to help us become our truest selves. To bring us closer totally. to 
to knowing, experiencing, and expressing our truer self, that centered self you speak of. So to me, coaching and IFS works well together because it's a pathway to that. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And, and very well spoken, yeah. It's exactly what I agree with. Another parallel I see with coaching and IFS is this, so we're talking, we're taught in coaching and NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, that any sign of resistance in a client is poor communication on the coach's part. Whereas IFS turns that completely around and I've embraced it immediately because it's just so, it resonates so strongly. It's resistance in a client is smart by the client because there is a part, a protector part that isn't feeling safe in that moment and is quite rightly spoken up. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity, again, a trailhead for us to go and visit that part and do what we do. And I just find that's got so much flow in it rather than saying, oh, my God, I've communicated poorly when I'm with a really defensive client. Because after a while, how do you get in? Uh -huh. <laughs> how many hoops is the coach do I jump through before I say, after all, actually, the resistance is really in the client. And this is very freeing now to know where to look for that. That's right, and um, and some of that comes from there was a point where I where clients were having really bad like backlash experiences after some of my sessions, yeah. And I started to realize these are delicate ecologies that I'm mucking around in, mm. and I better really learn the lay of the land and yeah. how to be an ecologically sensitive. Uh, explorer with them and so the map I described earlier came out of that it came out of sort of necessity if I was going to keep doing this and what I learned was uh, protectors often have a really good reason to not let you in yes yeah and and if we just try to trick them into letting us in that isn't gonna either it's not gonna yeah. work or they're gonna have consequences later yeah and so we learn to really respect the pace of the protectors and to mm. get to know them first and honor them for their service and let them know that we're not going anywhere without their permission mm. so, so they're the boss mm. and it's our job that. it's our job to make a case for why it might be in their best interest to let us do some of this but mm. You know, they know better than us the potential damage that could happen inside. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to push them. And, and they've been so doing that, only their job all this time. It's not like they know how to do something else just because we think we know best. As you say, we have the same goals. We have a very yeah. uh, non-pathologizing, we share a very non-pathologizing yes. sort yes. of um, positive uh, sense of human nature that we convey to clients and at the same time <clears throat> i think ifs offers language that helps people admit to things a lot more easily mm, well, there's <clears throat> like a hope. Thinking, you sell hope dick because there is a truer self that is in all of us so we coach the truer self rather than trying to fix something that is incredibly freeing that is tremendous. Yeah. That's right. And I, I'm doing a lot of work around racism now in the US. And uh, so it's one thing to listen, you know, to have a, a reaction inside that's racist and think, oh my God, I'm a racist and shame yourself to death and to try to lock away the parts that say that. And it's quite another to have that same reaction and then think, oh, I've got some parts that carry the burden of racism. I'm going to get to know them. Mm -hmm. And and I doesn't mean I'm a racist. I myself isn't a racist. I've got some parts that carry that legacy burden. So let me just get to know them and see what they need to be able to unload that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to bring to that whole conversation too. Mm -hmm. So not only does it make for an easier uh, easier to admit to things like that, but it also, um, you kind of know that you aren't 
these extreme things that are going on inside of you. You're much more than that. But it's also not labeling the person, which I just can't, I, right. I don't understand how labeling a person is helpful. I Shaming anyone, regardless of it, has never helped anybody heal or brought them back into the fold. So anything that helps remove shame and up the compassion, that's the mm -hmm. direction we want to start getting the narrative going in. It must be the language of compassion. That's the only path we're going to make progress. Totally agree. And that, that goes both for inside and outside. Yes, it because does. Because if they're... <clears throat> If you're working with a, a client as a coach and the client has a lot of anger, let's say, or yeah, and you're afraid of your own anger or you have an yeah. attitude about your, your own anger, yeah, then that's going to play out in your relationship with the coach, with the client. Mm. Or if, if you're afraid of your own exiles and your client gets very weepy or vulnerable. Vulnerable. Mm. It's going to be very hard for you to stay with them. You're going to try and perk them up, you know, or somehow yeah. get them away from it. So, or if you're driven by people pleasing, you're going to bring that to the coaching and not want to challenge the client. It's just right. there's so many ways we play out on the client. That's right. So this is a very practical way to get to know all those parts and change those inner relationships, and then yeah. you can be with people no matter how they are. That's it. One of the gifts, um, Dick, just to bring this towards the end, one of the gifts in this, I've been teaching uh, attachment theory for some time to some of our coaching students. This is a very different message to attachment theory. And yeah. to me, IFS is the placeholder that must come first. And then you can draw on attachment theory to perhaps indicate where the parts may be. But can you just talk us through how that is? It is quite different. Yeah, I, I like the way you put that because there's much I love about attachment theory. I think it's it's a yeah. huge gift to humanity. And there is this presumption in it that unless you had a certain kind of uh, parenting during a critical period in your childhood, you don't have any of this stuff that we're calling self. Yeah, You have to get it from somebody, from your wife or husband or or from your therapist at some point. It has to come from an interaction. It's not inherent in us. And that, yep. you know, I, I was a big believer in attachment theory when I started on this journey. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started seeing self in people who had horrible, horrible childhoods. There was yep. no way you could account for self showing up this way based on, on what their childhood was like. And I, I started to have started thinking, maybe this is just in us. Maybe it doesn't have to come mm. through an interaction. And I also I'd like to think of IFS as attachment theory taken inside. Yes. Because self becomes the good attachment figure yeah. to these insecure or avoidantly attached parts. I love that. I love that. So that rather than the therapist becoming that or the coach becoming that attachment figure. Yeah. You're actually promoting the person to become that attachment figure to themselves. And the gift in it, Dick, is with IFS, the client does the work for themselves with themselves. You may have That's an right. external guide who's the coach or the therapist, but you do the journey so you realize how truly empowered you are. Because every That's step right. you take and every step you make, it's you. No one did it. You can't say, oh my God, you're a great coach. Uh, I did that. That was my centered self showing up. That's phenomenal. What a gift. Yeah. And, and people can do a lot of it on their own. So people yes. are, I'll, I'll work with a client, we'll have a, a good session and then they'll go away and, and follow up. And the first, you know, 20 minutes of the next session, they're just telling me everything they did on their own with their parts. Yes. And then we go on and we do a little more. So. <laughs> it's, it's empowering. Too. So what are some daily practices? So anybody who's listened to this podcast, what are some daily practices we can do straight away to come closer to our truer self or our eight C's? Yeah. Um, so a lot of what we've been talking about is doing a U-turn in your focus. Like mm. how are you do a U-turn? 
but also a YOU turn. So as you go through the day, you're just kind of noticing your inner reactions and particularly noticing the more extreme ones. And instead of acting based on those reactions, you're using them as trailheads to find these parts that need your attention. Yeah. And if you don't have time during the day or you know, in the, the situation you're in, you, you kind of bookmark that. You say, oh my goodness, okay, I've got to follow up on this. And then you talk to your coach and your coach helps you follow that trailhead to find the part that needs to be healed. Mm. Mm. And and or needs more from you or need whatever you know, like we just did, and so then life, rather than being so full of uh, things you want to avoid or things that are so irritating, everything is oh okay, <laughs> another uh, effing growth opportunity. You know, it's it's that's it true. That's that, it. All these mm. things can help you grow. Yeah. One of the ways I use it in my daily practice, Dick, is I check in with myself throughout the day. Am I coming from my centered self, the eight C's? Or if I'm expressing yeah. something that's not one of the eight C's, that's to me an opportunity to reflect on me and what it is that I might be bringing energetically that's causing some imbalance or lack of harmony in this moment. And it doesn't mean say I always do something about it. I'm not... <laughs> I'm going to be human and sometimes I'm like, yeah, you go, you go for it. <laughs> Don't be the eight C's because I just feel dramatic or whatever. But at least I know now where I'm coming from, whether I'm grounded right. in me or I'm being taken over, allowed to myself to be taken over by this reactivity is the way I look at it. So to me, it's a lovely gauge to just check in for myself on where I'm coming from and my intent in this moment. Very good. Yeah. And that's true for me too. I'll check on the eight C's. I also have a few other markers that, uh, and, and people are idiosyncratic in this, but I'll check. Do I have a big agenda right now? Mm. If I do, then that's my definition of part. Okay. Yeah. Just step back. Just let me, just let me handle this. Yeah. Uh, or I can tell I'm very auditory, so I can tell by my tone of voice. Like yes. right now there's a, a nice resonance of self in my voice. When we yeah. started out, probably not as much. Um, nice. So I'm just kind of noticing how's my voice right now. Yeah. And then this energy that you experience for the first time. Now I'm just saying, do I have much of that energy going? Okay. Yes. If not, yeah, just open space, let it all come in. Wow. I love it. I, I really encourage anybody viewing this who's intrigued by the inner journey and wondering how to go about that, that IFS is a beautiful, gentle, compassionate, loving meditation to self. And there are lots of meditations, Dick, that I've been checking out and just experiencing for myself. It's part of my daily practice. But for anybody who wants to get more involved with IFS, where would you want to send them? Yeah, so we have a website, of course, which is uh, surprisingly ifs-institute.com. Mm -hmm. And on it, there are uh, lots of books like the one you talked about and videos. And we also have a, a year subscription online program called the Circle, on, Online Circle Program, which is you get a lecture from me every month and from some other trainers and yeah. Uh, a lot of people start out doing that. Um, I am coming out with a new book in uh, July called No Bad Parts Through Sounds True. And uh, that that's available for pre-order now. And uh, yeah, and, and as we were saying earlier, at some point, we really want to start training programs for coaches. Yes. Are, you know, right now, co coaches can join our training programs, and there are IFS trainings uh, going in Australia. Um, and, uh, but I want to make it coach programs exclusive for coaches mm. that has a, a curriculum based on the needs of coaches. And so we're actively working on that. Well, we want a program that's for non-clinical population. Uh, right. 
really that's that's what a coach would want to tap into the non-clinical aspects whereas of course your work comes from very much the clinical end of the spectrum yeah exactly the other thing i recommend is uh dick help me out with the title is it called the sum of our parts it's called greater than the sum of our parts that's it yeah and that's through sounds true also so that's on my that's so that's on my audible and i go to a meditation with you daily (laughs) every day my favorite is the pathway one that's one i've taught some of my coaches really oh that's great yeah 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 Yeah, that Uh one i love that richard you are a delight i am so so thrilled that we got to have this conversation finally i'm just so delighted with the work that you're doing and I can't wait to see what you'd bring to coaching and what we can do in that space. Yeah, I've, I've, I've loved the conversation too. I had no idea that uh, you knew so much about it and were so into it. So it's mm. been a great joy for me. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon, and, and you're a delightful person too. So. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're very, very kind. <laughs>